Hello and welcome to another Taekwondo Science video where we're covering sine wave motion. In the last video I showed you what happens to the sine wave when you do a technique on the spot with the same stance. And in today's video I'll show you what happens to the sine wave when you do the technique on the spot changing from one stance to another. When changing stance on the spot, one of your feet has to move to a new position. Now it can be the rear foot, but most often it's the front foot that moves. For example, the eighth movement in Chungun Tul, where you go from L stance to walking stance, you move your front foot. And in the same pattern, the 21st movement of Chungun Tul, you go from walking stance to L stance, again moving the front foot. The shape of your sine wave motion curve will depend on which stance you start off with and finish with. As I explained in video 4 of this series, the height of your body in a particular stance will depend on the stance that you're in. For example, the longer wider stances, your body will be lower and the narrower stances or the ones with the legs straight will mean that your body is a lot higher. So the shape of the curve will have different values of H0 and H3 depending on which stance it is. So if you're going from a lower stance to a higher stance, H0 will be less than H3 and vice versa. This is common sense. But what's more interesting is what happens to the values of H1 and H2. H1 being the height of your body at the end of stage 1 of your sine wave motion and H2 the height of your body at the end of stage 2 of the sine wave motion. So let's look at what happens at stage 1 of the sine wave motion when you're changing stance, for example going from L stance to walking stance. You need to load the weight onto the rear leg so that you can be balanced, so your front foot will move back. Now if you move it back to within a shoulder width distance from your rear foot, you should be able to remain balanced. If you don't bring it back enough, you're probably going to topple forward. And bringing it back more than a shoulder width is probably not necessary because you're going to bring that leg forward again, so it will just be a waste of time. So that front foot will move about a third of the way back, so it's about shoulder width away. Now that position is called a neutral position and it really doesn't matter what stance you're going to go into, that position will be very similar. So let's look at what happens when you go to a neutral position from various stances. If you're in a vertical stance or a parallel stance, your feet are about one shoulder width apart. So just by raising one foot, you're already almost in the neutral position, but you have to relax so you bend your knees, which has the effect of lowering your body. So in this case, the value of H1 is going to be less than H0. But if you're in a rear foot stance, you already have your knees bent and your feet are about one shoulder width apart. So when you raise the foot, you're almost there into a neutral position. So as you relax, your body may drop very slightly, but not much, not as much as when you're in parallel stance or vertical stance. So the value of H1, just slightly less than H0. When you're going from L stance to a neutral position, you need to pull that front foot a lot further back, so you go to a, a one shoulder width apart, and this has the effect of raising your body. But as you relax, you bend your knees, which has the effect of lowering your body. The net effect is that your height hardly changes. Now, it will feel as though you're lowering your body because you're bending your knees, but from an outside view, the observer will not notice much difference in your height, so H1 will be very similar to H0. But if you're going from walking stance or fixed stance or even low stance, you're going to raise the body a lot more because you were lower down. And although you bend your knees, the net effect will be that you do raise your body slightly higher. So the value of H1 will be slightly higher than H0. The value of H1 will be very similar in all cases, regardless of which stance you're going from or even which stance you're going to because a neutral position looks very similar in all cases. So there may be some slight differences in height, but there's not much in it. So let's look at the end of stage 2, the value of H2 for these various stances. If you're going to a parallel stance or a vertical stance, your legs will end up being straight as you finish the technique. So at the end of stage 2, the only way you can drop into the stance is by raising the heels and drop it and not uh, bending the knees. So the value of H2 is going to be about one or two centimeters higher than H3. 
Now with uh, rear foot stance, you can bend the knee, so you can use knee spring to drop the body, but there's no need to straighten the legs as with the, uh, the other two stances, because in fact, with all the other stances, it's no good to straighten the legs because that will create a sawtooth wave. It will make the movement very jerky and you need a nice smooth transition. So the value of H2 is going to be about two centimeters or slightly more uh, lower than if you're doing vertical stance or parallel stance. If you're doing L stance or even walking stance, fixed stance and then low stance, these stances get progressively longer, it's harder to go higher. So the value of H2 will be progressively lower for each of those stances as is the value of H3. Now, the value of H2 is always gonna be higher than the value of H3 because that's the point of sine wave. You need to drop into the stance as you perform the technique. The graphs I showed you for stage one and the graphs for stages two and three can be combined together in different permutations. So for example, if you're going from parallel stance to rear foot stance, you can put these two graphs together. And if you're going from say L stance to walking stance, you can put these two together and that will give you an idea of what the sine wave motion should look like. Now as a practitioner you shouldn't be too concerned about whether your body's moving up and down in the correct way because sine wave motion is not something that you try to force it's something that should happen if you're doing the movements naturally and correctly. It's more important to remember the key points so when you're changing stance on the spot Remember to bring the foot to within one shoulder width distance of your balancing foot so that you remain balanced and bend your knees as you relax. And when you reposition your foot to the new stance, try and move in a smooth transition and avoid any jerky movements. When raising the body in stage two, avoid locking your legs straight. Otherwise this will create sawtooth wave. And if you're doing vertical stance and parallel stance, you do need to straighten the legs, but don't do it too soon. You just straighten the legs as you drop. And if you need to reposition your balancing foot, you may need to pivot. You must have the heel off the ground because you always pivot on the ball of the foot. So if you remember these key points and all the other key points that I've mentioned in previous videos, then your sine wave should be okay. Now I hope you'll join me for the next video which I'll show you how to do sine wave when you're stepping forwards and backwards or when you're turning, in other words when you're pivoting. So I hope you join me for that one. And please subscribe if you haven't done so already. So I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.